and as it says this chapter is about installing the rest of the basic system software so you don't need these tools but obviously recommended like e2fs progs if you want to format discs uh, you're going to need it um, file lib tool module tools so there's some other really useful packages that should be installed here So I've got a note here against this package that I didn't get the SCSI error that's mentioned here. Now whether that's related to the SCSI error that we got before where I included the kernel header file, um, I don't know. Uh, but we'll see if I get it again this time. So let's extract it. So configure it with configure. Compile it with make. And as you can see, it's built successfully again. There's no errors at all. Um, so like I said, I can only assume it's maybe something to do with that other issue with the SCSI header file. So let's make install. And we need to create a check root boot script. So whenever we boot our LFS system, the root file system will check by FSCK. So we need to create this file here, check root. Insert and just copy the whole of the script. And save it. So updating etc init the U mount fs. Edit the etc init the U mount. Yeah, see now there's a spelling mistake here. It should be U mount fs. So we need to copy that partially press tab oops and that's the file it should be not u mounts there's no such file and it says under the hash begin etc init d mount u mount fs line so arguably under that line there we need to add these two lines to deactivate the swap and save that. Change the permissions on that file to allow it to be executable and create a sim link. 
So this needs to be in run level three. And create a link. And that is it for E2FS progs. So let's go back to sources. Uh, E2FS progs there. So RM minus RF E2FS progs. Let's just check. Right, neck I don't want to delete that. Extra, don't want to delete that. So it's all clean. So now we've got to install file. Uh, oh, hang on, I've got another. Notes here. Um, uh, let me just cut that file again. ATC init new mount. All right, I see. It looks like I had uh, some sort of problem with that file, which isn't there. So it must have been something to do with how I created that file. Yeah, I can't see anything there that relates to what the comment is I've got in the book. So I'll just cross that out. So, yeah, so on to file now. So the cat file so I can configure make install and that's done. So next we've got libtool. And again, configure make install. And that's done. Next we've got module tools. So although we've got haven't got any modules at the moment, the kernel could be built with modules, so we'll need this. So this time we've got configure. It needs to be built with the older GCC. And install it. Right, yeah, I've got an install bin error one here. Now I did make note that that happened when I was testing this. Now the only thing I can think of is that we should still specify the older GCC. So let's try it. No, we're still getting it. So it can't be the fact that it's the wrong version of the GCC. Um, so I don't know why that is. Um, but we do seem to get the uh, programs installed correctly in SPIN. Let's have a look in SPIN. Um, what was there there? Uh, 
their mod info in in ints mod, for example, RM mod and mod probe. Um, mod info mod probe is a link to ins mod, so that means that must exist. There it is there. So and all today's date. In fact, the only file that hasn't got today's date so far is LD config there. Yeah, and swap off is that's that old link. So everything else has got today's date. So everything's been updated that we built previously that would be part of that um, package. So that's all okay as far as I'm concerned. So mod utils, tidy that up. And move on to Linux 86. Now I had a bit of a fun time with Linux 86. It seems that it's floating around, or it used to float around under various different names, Linux 86, Bin 86, and something else I can't remember what. And it seems like it they are all do the similar thing, but written by different people, from what I could make out. Um, and I'm not sure if some of the confusion comes from the fact that the binaries are called bin, or one one example of distribution was called bin eighty six, um, or or even Linux eighty six was referred to as bin eighty six. And what it is, it seems to be a um, an assembler and linker for eight oh eight six assembly programs. Um, so I think I've got the right one uh, called Linux eighty six. Um, the the th this is part of the confusion that the tarball was called bin 86. So that's why there's a lot of confusion when I was trying to find this. And I heard, well, not, not heard, I saw people referring it to Linux 86 and people referring it to, to it as bin 86 and so on. So it was a little bit confusing. In the end, because of that confusion, I decided just to take the version that was off the SUSE Linux disk. Uh, rather than risk either downloading the wrong one or something that was, you know, incompatible or, you know, just some unknown reason. So um, I decided to stick with what SUSE had used. So that's the version that's used here. And it seemed to work all right. It produces the correct binaries. Uh, it doesn't seem to have any problems. So bin 86... And another thing was it says, and this maybe indicates possibly it's not the same version that was used originally when this document was made, but it says to um, unpack it and then go into the AS directory and run make. Now, that didn't work for me. Um, if I run it, um, what error did I get? Yeah, see, there's an error there. And the same thing happened when I went to the LD directory and did the same thing. So what I decided to do was just build it as normal. So if I tied it up, extract it again, bin 86, you'll see there's no config file there. So I'll just run make on its own. And you can see it seems to go to the LD directory first. So whether that's the problem just there, then it goes to the AS directory. So I wonder if these instructions should be the other way around. And in any case, what's the point if it seems to build from the root directory? Um, so as you can see, it's gone to LD, built some stuff, left LD, then it's gone to AS, built some more stuff, then it's linked them all. And that's it. So, yeah, I'm not quite sure why these instructions are as they are. So now we need to f uh, copy the following files. It says, so copy AS86. So this is in these directories now. So let's change AS. Yep, there it is there. So CPAS86 to for slash user bin and then go back to LD and copy LD 86 there it is there to user bin and that's it it does actually say it's only used for Lilo 
which we're going to install next, but I'm not going to run it because I don't really want to risk trashing the system at this stage without taking it back up first. Um, but I'm sure there'd be no problem with it. It builds successfully. There's no exceptions to the instructions that are there that I've um, noted at all. Um, uh, and we've got a working boot, so why would you why would you change it anyway? But we'll build it for complete this because you might want to lift this image, this partition image, and put it on another machine. And use use the, the image somewhere else. So it's it's good to have it built and ready. Uh, so Lilo, Tom on six feet. So we run make. and make install so now it says copy the etc lilo.conf file from your normal linux system to the etc directory on the lfs system so first of all we need to mount slash dev slash hda5 and put it in mount And then we'll copy the etc lilo conf that's there and put it in our own etc directory. Let's have a look at that. So what I'm going to do here is to make I'm not sure how you make this the default, uh, change the default actually. Let's see if I can find that out rather than having to copy and paste, uh, move the, uh, lab the de label definitions around. Okay, so it's just a simple case of whatever's the first one, right? So it, I never really liked Lilo because it seemed to be so basic. And um, again, it, it lives up to that image. So what we need to do, or what I want to do is make the uh, Linux from scratch the default. So I basically need to, it's probably easy it's just to copy it like this actually. Insert. Paste that there. And delete this lines here. Save that. Now it's kind of academic because like I said, I'm not going to alter the boot up as it is. I'm just going to leave it um, as it boots at the moment. But if I do, this, say for example, I did move this image to another machine, then it would be the primary boot. Um, and then it would matter, but as it is, this won't make a difference, but at least we've done some of the preparation. Copy the kernel images from the boot directory from your normal Linux system to boot on the LFS system. So I actually want to copy the, um, MNT boot. Well, it's not there because it's a separate partition, but I can copy it from user source uh, Linux boot. Is it boot? Um, Arch i386 boot bz image. So that's the actual kernel that was built, and I want to move that into boot and call it um, LFS dash 
In fact, I think if I call it VM Linux dash LFS dash one dot zero and then copy system dot map there as well for completeness. And also copy the config as well, just so I've got a backup of that. And that's as much as I'm going to do. I'm not going to run Lilo or anything to reconfigure that. I don't want to overwrite the boot code that's already on the disk. At least everything's there ready to if I did decide that's what I want to do. So let's unmount the SUSE partition and tidy up Lilo. Now we move on to dpackage. So this is the script or the program that's missing that would allow the um, Telnet daemon to auto start. So I won't test it as soon as I've installed it. I'll carry on finishing the install off, then I'll reboot and test it. So this is called dpackage. And we go to the scripts directory. Compile start dot stop daemon program by running make start stop daemon. And we copy that program to sbin. And we copy start stop daemon dot eight. To user man eight and that's it next sys k log d So I compile the package by running make cc etc using the old GCC and install it with that command. Right, bin install. So that's actually looking for bin install. And we moved it for some reason. Or it wasn't, yeah, we moved it. So that's interesting. Oh, I see. I see. The yeah, that's that's strange. So the instructions have told us to move it out of bin into user bin, um, and then these instructions haven't been updated to reflect the fact that it's been moved. So let's adjust that to user bin, and it finishes correctly. So let's now move on and create the var log directory. And, uh, var log. Create a new etc syslog.conf Go to insert mode and copy this configuration and save it. Then create a sysklogd boot script. Just copy all of this. Oh, okay, I didn't want to copy all the way for some reason. No, it's not copying when I'm scrolling. So let's try like that. It's quite a big script. Save that. Setting up Simlinks permissions. So we do that to make it executable. Create the proper links by running the following commands. So once again, we're going to change into run level three, not two. Create 
create a startup script. Going to change into the um, oh, is it the halt? I can never remember. I think it's the restart. Uh, run levels here they are. Yes, yeah, six is the re reboot. So change into the reboot directory. Done that, and now we do the kill script and then the initialization directory and create a or oh sorry the halt directory and create a kill script for that one as well so now let's move back to sources remove sys k log d and carry on with groff Configure, make, make install. So let's recall that command. Wait for it to finish.
Okay, so Groff is built, it's installed, we can tidy it up. Move on to MANDB. Right, what's this one called? Oh, man underscore db. Now this one I had problems with um, building it due to the national language support. Um, so I'm going to see if it fails again in the same way. Yes, I think there's an error there. Yes, there was. There's a couple of errors. So what I found was the way to fix this. And again, I'm going to tidy this up first before I do anything. Extract it and start fresh. What I found was to, as part of the configure command, configure, was to add, um, oh no, it wasn't the configure, sorry, it's the make command. We'll still run it with make um, nls equals en underscore gb. So I imagine you need to substitute your own language and locale to uh, make that valid. And as you can see, it seems to be building okay. However, that's the correct way of dealing with this situation. I don't know, but it does allow a successful build as you can see it's completed there aren't any errors so not quite sure what goes on there but anyway make install and that's done So proc ps, so this one is, yeah, proc ps, so cat. So make it with the older GCC version. And then we need to edit the make file and it says to comment out the variable XS CPT. So that's that one there. So to comment out, we just put a hash in front of it and save it. And then we can run make install and that's done. So proc PS gives us top. And if I run top now, You'll see how basic the system is still. We've got what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen processes running, and five of them are virtual terminals. So in theory, if we remove those lines from the init tab, we'd have you know ten or a dozen or so processes at the, at the most. Running, so you can see how absolutely minimal this system is. Um, Telnet D wouldn't be running either if we were running this just locally, and Top wouldn't be running. So in theory, we'd have one for init, two, three, four, five, five, six, and seven, because we're in a bash session. If we didn't have a swap, we'd be we'd have six processes running. So it really is a very very minimal system, as you can see. Um, and yet it's a working system, a fully fully blown Linux system. 
So let's now tidy up proc ps. Uh, yep. And move on to proc info. Now one of these has got a bit of a funny name. It's hard to... Oh, it's the PS misc one. It's just called proc misc. Proc info is the is okay. So Z cat proc info. So again, we build with the older GCC version. And install with make install. And that's done. And now we move on to proc misc or ps misc. Run it with make. And make install to install it. And it's done. So now we go on to shadow password. It says this package contains the utilities to modify users' passwords, add new users' groups, delete users' groups, and more. I'm not going to explain to you what password shadowing means. You can read all about that in the doc how to file. There's one thing you should keep in mind if you decide to use Shadow Support, the programs that need to verify passwords, examples or XDM, etc. need to be Shadow compliant, so it's probably a good idea to install this. Um, it says that um, the implications of not using it, if you don't want to use Shadow Passwords after you've read the how-to document, you still use this archive since the utilities in this archive are also used on the system with have Shadow Passwords disabled. So you still need to build and install this. It's just whether you activate the Shadow Passwords or not. Again, it's all in the how-to and it says, again, it does say in the how-to that you can switch between Shadow and non-Shadow Passwords at any point. So let's extract it. Start with configure. Build the package.
Okay, that's compiled. Let's now install it. And next we need to copy these files to etc. Oh, they're from the etc directory actually. So let's just cancel that, go into etc, recall that. And that's all copied okay. Then it says rename the etc login defs to dot linux to etc login defs um, so let's go to etc and do mv login defs dot linux to just login dot defs now is a very good moment to read section five of the how to file uh, you can read it you can read how you can test if shadowing works or not and how to disable it. If it doesn't work, you haven't tested it, you'll end up with an unusable system. Uh, it tells you how to recover from this. So when you do the, um, uh, do read the help instructions, it's fairly straightforward. I'll just go through here. I won't go through reading in it, um, but I'll just go through the commands that I performed. So this login defs, if we look at it, um, you'll see it's got permissions of uh, 644 um, and it says it's best to change it to 700. So it's um, read, writable and executable by the root only and not readable by anybody else or ex executable or writable by anybody else. So let's change that now. So let's take a look at that again. You can see now it's just only the root that can do anything with that file. Um, then it says to run the command from the etc directory, which is where we are. Run the command user sbin pa password conf, I presume it's password convert. So that's that. Then it says to shown the password program as root uh, or the password so that file there oops <coughs> so it's already owned owned by the root but in case it isn't it says to use this form of can't command. Now, I can't think that it's any different to doing root colon root, which is what I use, or even zero colon zero. Um, this might have been an older way of doing it, perhaps. So that's that. So I don't doubt if anything would have changed there. No, it looks exactly the same. Then it says to change the permissions on that file to 644. Well, it looks like they already are 644. Uh, but there's no harm in rerunning it again, just to be sure. Uh, yes, the, the permissions haven't changed. And then to change the permissions on the shadow file to 0640, so that makes it read-writable by root, readable by um, anybody part of the group that password is. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I've done chone644 to password instead of chmod. Yeah. I thought that's strange. What well, uses 644? So I need to change. Let's just run this again. Yep. And 
that needs to be smaller than not shown. Right, that's better. Um, yeah, so the shadow, need, the shadow file needs to be changed to 0640 so that it be read writable by root and readable by anybody in the root group and not accessible by anybody else who hasn't got those permissions. So chmod, make sure I do the right command this time. Uh, 0640 shad shadow. So that's that. So um, what I did next was to run password to change the password of the root to actually give it a password because at the moment it hasn't got a password and everybody can just type root and gain access to the root user. So just to make it a little bit more secure, I'm going to run password, type in a password. Okay, it's a weak one just for my convenience, but it proves a point. And then next in the uh, chapter five of the shadow, it does say to, or section five, it does say to check that see to see if you can log in from another terminal. Now I've got the problem at the moment that I've got one access into um, the machine remotely. I haven't got the ability to view the monitor at the moment. Um, just because it's not, I, you know, I haven't got that configuration at the moment. I'd have to reboot and restart and so on to set that up. So um, if I log out or reboot now, I won't get any access, but at least it gives you some hints as to how you can get back in again to try and fix it. Um, so I think what I will do is if I do control D here, it will come out. I'll have to, I'll just press the up arrow on the keyboard to recall the last command, which will start Telnet D again and press enter. And I'll try to access again. So I'll type in root and the password and with any luck, yes, I'm in. So, and it accepted the password that I just set. It didn't just automatically log me in. It, it requested the password and it accepted the correct password. Normally I'd also check this on another virtual terminal as well as just from remotes, but um, I'm pretty happy that this remote access will mean that it's it's fully fully working. The shadow password is wording is uh, working correctly. So I go back to sources. Looks like we're done with shadow. So I'm going to delete that now. And finally, the last package we're going to install is the GNU C++ library. So let's extract that. It's called lib standard C. So we unpack it, run configure. Okay, so that's configured. Now we build it.
Right, so that's finished compiling, and there's some text there about the fact that it doesn't install as default, and it's got to be fixed up to get it to work. So why that is, I don't know. But what we need to do is to go into the source directory and create these links and copy some files to fix it up to enable it to install correctly. So we'll just copy these one at a time as usual and just inspect the output. Um, there shouldn't be any because we've not got the verbose option set on any of these. So as long as it comes back quietly, that's good. So that's everything done. So now we can do make install. And that looks like it's all complete. So I'll just tidy that up now. And I think that's all there is for Linux from scratch. Um, let's just check we've done everything here. Yeah, we did all this. We're not doing anything in the email section. Uh, we've set up the Telnet daemon and client and we installed it. Uh, let's do where it is Telnet. Okay, I thought we installed the find, find utils. Uh, okay, it's, maybe where is this part of another package then? So Telnet. Okay, so it hasn't been created yet. So let's do update. So this will create a find database. Um, and in theory, this should be part of a cron job to get updated regularly. But now we've done that, you can see it's found everything in fact it's looked in the sources so it might need to be configured to tell it not to look in the sources directory but that's a personal thing so yes we've got user bin telnet and you can see we've got user bin in dot telnet d as well so it definitely has been installed um we configured it so let's just take a look at that to make sure that's there, yep, there's that binary we just saw. There it is there, oops. User bin in .telnet D. So we've got the daemon ready and waiting. And yes, it was just the start stop daemon script, which didn't exist, which now should exist. There it is there. So in theory, um, should be able to reboot. Let's have a look at this. Did we do this? I think we did this as well, didn't we? Let's check that. Yes, that's got 755, and I'm pretty sure we did the etc rc3 has got an inet d. Yes, shortcut, so that's fine. Not using pro ftp, Apache testing the daemon so we've already been using the telnet d but in theory all i need to do uh, let's just check the next chapter so that's the x window so that's another video i'm going to do but it's not really as far as i'm concerned it's not really part of lfs although it is part of lfs 1.0 which is why i decided to complete it anyway um so what i'm going to do is to reboot here Allow the machine to reboot into Linux from scratch. And is that going to come back that prompt? Doesn't look like it. And yeah, it's rebooted. So hopefully that link will drop out a minute. Um, so I can try and turn it in again. 
Just waiting for the machine to actually start up. So again, I'm doing this blindly, but it should work. So I've just typed LFS 1.0 at the Lilo prompt. It is loading the looks of it. Um, yeah, in theory, I should be able to just turn that straight in, log out and turn it in again, because that script should be working. The boot script should be working. Um, and it should all be fine. So it looks like it's come back up again. I'm not sure why this hasn't dropped out. Not to worry. Let's try accessing it in another session. So yes, there we go, LFS 1.0. So we booted into the right system. And as you can see, the telnet has offered us a prompt straight away. I type in root and it's asked me for a password. I type in the password that I set off to shadow and I'm in. So there you go, there's the LFS1 kernel string, um, version 2.2.13, which we installed. You can see it was installed or sorry, compiled on December 14th uh, for an i586 uh, architecture. So you can see that's all correct. So now if I log out and try and connect again, you can see it's allowing me to connect again. It hasn't, well, it it may have dropped out but it's being managed correctly by the boot scripts so that looks like that one's dropped out now yeah so i should in theory be able to connect here as well and have two sessions running side by side and there you go so there's one there and there's one there and if i do top we should be able to see both those sessions uh, yeah, there's two, you can see there's two Inet, uh, Telnet daemons running and there's two bash prompts running as well, two bash shell, bash shells running. And also, if you look at the memory, you can see that there's uh, about five and a half megabytes used, so there's only five and a half megabytes. If you take off two and a half of that, so that's about three uh, megabytes take off another 700k for the buffers then you're left with about 2.3 megabytes that's in use and that's with two sessions running um, and as I say six um, virtual terminals as well so you can see how little memory is used in, a, in an extremely basic system and this explains why Linux is used in so many embedded devices because it, it's got a sw quite a small footprint so the very last thing I'm going to do is just to reboot on the actual terminal to show it booting up to prove that there's no errors. Um, we've seen that we can connect to it now. So I'll just shut this one down now. And um, boot up onto the actual terminal. And then in the next video, I'll go on to... Um, build the GUI which as you can see is only a handful of libraries anyway it's this one here this one that one that one and that one ungif and window maker and that's effectively it it's you know literally just a handful so let's do reboot in fact I'll shut this down so you can see it booting right from scratch Make sure that logs out properly this time, the connection. So the machine, that's another thing. With SUSE Linux, for some reason, I don't know, there must be something set incorrectly in the terminal, in the kernel, sorry, or the kernel's so old. Because um, we've got the newer kernel, maybe. Uh, the machine actually shuts down properly when you shut down. With the SUSE Linux, it just shuts down and sits there. You need to actually physically power down. But I'll say with this kernel... Or maybe the kernel configuration, I'm not sure which. It, it doesn't actually shut down when you uh, do the shutdown command. It powers down properly. Right, so LFS-1.0.
okay so that's all booted okay and you can see oh we've got one little problem here on check route uh don't think i had a fix for that Oh, that's what that, what was it, that one? Um, let's just fix that. It's this, although it didn't affect what we were testing, this is the bit that checks the file system at boot time to make sure it's not, um, uh, you know, there's no corruption or anything. And it could probably fix this message where it's advising us that we do a, a file system check. So let's, oh, wrong keyboard. Uh, let's, go in and check that so it is uh, we've got something there about proc not mounted might have to check that as well well I don't know why that's changed it might be something to do with this error so let's do vim etc rc3 in fact, it'll be init. Dot D will be the source. That should be the best place to look. And it says line thirty-nine. Expect unexpected EOF while looking for matching. Double quote and line forty-four syntax error. Unexpected end of file. So line. Okay, I've got no line numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Um, yeah, I don't quite know what's gone on here because I didn't have this problem. Uh, let's try running it manually. At least we should get an error saying it can't run it. No, it still says the EOF are looking for a matching double quote on line 39. Right, it looks like there's a problem there. Let's just get the original script up. Maybe it didn't copy properly. Uh, this is the check route, isn't it? Check boots rather, E2FS progs. Oh, yes, I wonder why I didn't get this error. It's only got one double quote there. Um, I think off the top of my head. If you put in, well, that's if it works in this old version, I think minus C will put a blank line in, which I presume is what, is what, what was wanted. So let's try and run that. Yep. So it is fixing something. Oh yes, it might be in that time that I didn't, Oh no, it says it wasn't unmounted. Not sure about that. Uh, 
Okay, so I'm hoping that wasn't set to read right when it did that. Let's do another reboot and see if it is behaving better this time. Okay, LFS dash one dot zero. Okay, that's interesting why we're getting that proc not mounted now. Right, so yeah, that script's now worked. It's saying that HDA6, which is our root direct, uh, root partition, is clean. It's remounted in rewrite mode, so that's okay. Oh, then it's mounted the pro. Oh, yes, that's right. I did make a note of this. For some reason, uh, the system log daemon, the script number, has been set to run before the proc file system has been um, activated. So if we log in and go to um, etc rc3, you'll see that the um, file systems are mounted uh, at level 10, but the syslog d, I think that was the one that was failing, wasn't it? Yes, the system log daemon is set to run at three. So what it means is it's trying to use something in proc and it can't because it hasn't been mounted yet. So there's a discrepancy there as well in the book. Um, so what I did with this was I renamed the, um, rightly or wrongly, I don't know if it should, maybe it should be early because it is a, a logging script, but I moved so3 sysklogd to s let's put that back in as s yeah i changed it to 13 so it's going to be the logging daemon is going to be activated at start level 10 but because it's 13 it's a higher number than 10 it'll be activated after mount fs so if i do that and you can see now that mount fs will occur before syslog d so now let's reboot again and this time we shouldn't get any errors in theory So no, it's still syncing the screen. It's booting. You should see something come up in a minute. There it goes. So LFS-1.0. And that's better. The only thing it's suggesting is that, well, it says dev HDA3 is insecure permissions, and that's a partition. So whether that's the iNode, uh, not the iNode, sorry, the... Um, block device, uh, what's it called, the node that's uh, been created in slash dev that's got the wrong permissions, I don't know, but as you can see, everything else has worked now. We've got the proc file systems loaded, and then the logging daemons have been started, and finally the internet server daemon has been started. So I should be able to prove that's working by doing telnet into lfs-1.0. And you can see it's asking me to log on to this machine that I'm already on. So I can do that, log in, and there's a Telnet session running locally, back, back on itself. So if I do Control D, you can see it's just dropped that connection and back at my real root prompt. So, yeah, that's Linux from scratch 1.0.
um, with all the foibles sorted out in the book. I mean, despite them, I mean, it's, it's a great effort done by Gerard Beekman's, um, you know, by one man to show how a, a distribution can be built from scratch uh, by itself is a great achievement. And it's great in that it's still going uh, 24 years later. So in the next video, I'll be um, installing the GUI system, which will be the final part of Linux from Scratch 1.0, just to make it a little bit more complete. Um, and just show, I guess, it actually being used with an app rather than just the basic tools for a minimal Linux from Scratch system.